If I were to ask you, what are the top subjects or the the top things that Jesus taught about or preached about that were important evidently to him, what would you say? You know, some of you might say, well, love. Jesus preached a lot on love, and that's true, but that's not the answer. Maybe some of you would say the gospel or, or would say the kindness uh, of being kind to other people or maybe heaven and hell. Christ spoke an awful lot about hell. That's true, but, but you would be wrong if you would say those things. It probably would not shock you to know that the first thing, that the, most, uh, the preeminent thing that Jesus spoke about was the kingdom, about himself being the king and prepare through him for the kingdom and do the kingdom of God work here on this earth. So that wouldn't shock you. But the second most thing, as far as the amount of times that he spoke about something, might shock you. The second highest thing or most that Jesus ever spoke about was money. 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 In fact, uh, according to Forbes magazine, money is the number two most referenced topic in the entire Bible. Money. Eleven out of 39 parables of Jesus were about, in some ways, money. One out of every seven verses in the book of Luke has something to do with money. And in that Forbes uh, article that I'm referencing, the the article was called, Is the Bible the Ultimate Finance Guide? They cite 2,000 references in Scripture to money. Wow. Well, why is that true? You know, is, is God a, a money grubber? Preachers are, are often uh, accused of being money grubbers. And I've heard things like, every time I come to your church, I, I preach on, or that you preach on money. I think a great thing in our, our history of Lighthouse is that I find the, and this is weird, I know, but the, the least that I preach about money, it seems like the more you give, all right? So that's, I, we got a good thing going. <laughs> is Jesus, Jesus a money grubber? Well, Jesus did not have a house to lay his head. The one who made all creation said that, you know, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I don't have a place even to lay my head. Is God a muddy grubber? Obviously not, you know. He uses pure gold as asphalt. He can create any any, uh, wealth of any size that he would want. He can perfectly make anything that he wants. I believe that the Lord spoke so much in scripture about money because he knew our hearts or he knows our hearts. He knew that, that money would give mankind such a hard time and womankind for that matter. God needed to address both greed and idolatry in our hearts that would keep some from being saved. You know that loving money can keep a person from from getting saved. Idolatry of of money. And others, the scripture says, we're going to look at a verse today, the others, believers who have come to know Christ, that some who give themselves to the pursuit of money would pierce themselves through with many sorrows and would get off track from the faith. They would err from the faith. They would get outside of doing what the Lord wanted them to do and being a faithful believer because of money. And I'll just make you mad right here at the beginning. I believe it is so awkward and so controversial and uncomfortable to talk and for a pastor to preach about money because there is such territorial ownership in our hearts, mine included, about money and our possessions. That's what makes it tough. As we continue the series that we're on, Framework of the, of the Christian uh, Life series, we have been seeing the stewardship of three T's, okay? We saw talents like in our, our spiritual gifts, and we talked about that a lot. We saw, the last time we saw the stewardship of our time, and tonight, or today, excuse me, we see the, the stewardship of our treasure. So take your Bible, please, and turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. Would you stand, please? Hear the word of God. Hebrews 13. Beginning in verse number 5. Here's some pages. I'll wait just a second. Hebrews is one of those books that's hard for me to find in my Bible sometimes. It just kind of gets stuck in there. Hebrews 13, beginning of verse number 5, says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. 
so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You may be seated. I would give you the context, normally, you know, we preach expositorily, and I would give you the context all around these verses and before these verses and what's going on, but the fact is that this is a machine gun passage where nearly every verse is speaking about something different in kind of, kind of uh, 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 machine gun fashion, and there is no context. Verse 5 and 6 is their own context. Just like last week's message on time, this message is, is on stewardship. You know, we talked about the stewardship of time. You know, something, stewardship is something that God has entrusted to you. And we need to really just establish that truth right away concerning our finances and concerning our money and our treasure. It is a stewardship. The Bible says in Psalm 24 and verse number 1, it says, a Psalm of David, the earth is the Lord's. You see that possessive Lord's? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. 1 Corinthians 2. 10 and verse 26 repeats the same verse, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, what's that mean to us? Well, L-O-R-D apostrophe S is possessive. It means, folks, that, that he owns it. Owns what? Well, what's the verse say? The earth and the fullness or the wealth thereof. All of it. All the content that you find on the earth in the universe for that matter. And and in fact, it says, and they that dwell therein. It's not only that he owns the earth, it's not only that he owns the wealth, he owns you. Concerning the fact that he is your creator, you are the creation of your hands, God owns everything. You know, we say things like this, my home and my car. Well, my car, blah, blah. You know, my 401k, my computer, my bank account, my iPad, whatever. God says, whoa, whoa, hold on a minute. What did you say? It's it's not really yours. You know, I I let you manage it. I decided how much you should have. I allowed you to to earn money, to breathe and to earn money and to to buy that. But whoa, whoa, whoa. All these my, 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 that's not exactly accurate. You see, God has a claim on everything. Everything is his, the Lord says. You know, his claim on everything, and some people really have disputed that or can't really come to grips with that. His claim on everything is really at least, at least threefold. First of all, he created everything. Okay, if you're the maker of everything, you can kind of say it's mine. All right? So secondly, he gave the ability to you, the health, the brains to gain whatever you have. He is the one that allowed your body to get, you know, education or get training or whatever or 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 for you to function, for you to be able to to drive up to the mall to buy the stuff. You know, so he he gave gives this power. And the the third the third reason why he's a claim on everything is he sustains everything. Most of you are gonna continue breathing through the end of this message. I shouldn't say things like that, because if some of us went home to glory and I would feel bad about that I said that. But he sustains everything, your breath, your heartbeat, you know, gravity, for instance. You know, he sustains everything, so he can pretty much say, you have and you're going to continue to enjoy anything that you enjoy or you possess or you own or whatever, because I allow you to. I, I give you the opportunity to. Everything is mine, he says. Everything in the earth is mine and the fullness of the earth. And by the way, you are mine. Everything is his in the universe. So when we kind of have this conversation about our treasure... We must come from the ownership perspective that everything that I have, Toby has, is God's. I've been entrusted with it. You know, it's not really a loan kind of thing. It's, you know, management. That's the right word. I've been entrusted uh, with it to manage for him, for his glory. And folks, that simple truth alone addresses many of mankind's struggle with, with our money. Since all that I have belongs to God... How does he want me to use it? That is a valid question. That is a real question that you should write on the top of your budget. How does he want me to use it? It's his. Our verses here in Hebrews, if you see here, they form a great outline that allow us to begin talking about treasure. And I want to just tell you what, there are so many verses, you know, approximately 2,000 in scripture. When I began to work with this, it it is overwhelming. I mean, you could could preach literally for years on the subject of money and treasure from the scriptures. 
Well, we're not going to preach from years. Amen for that. Some of you wouldn't come back to this church anymore, and I understand. I wouldn't either. But uh, we are going to begin talking about the Lord's views, his thoughts on our money, our treasure. Look at, please, Hebrews chapter 13, beginning verse number 5. Let your conversation be without covetous. Number one, don't love money. That's simple enough, isn't it? Three words, don't love money. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Don't love money. Your conversation here in the verse, of course, is your lifestyle. It is your way of life. It's a a good early English, early modern English word that talked about your behavior or how things go in your life. And we see an interesting thing here in the word that God chooses to use for covetousness. The underlying word, there are many words through the epistles that mean covet or translated covetous. This, was a, this is interesting because right in the middle, in the heart of this word, it has the word phileo in it. We are not far from Philadelphia, the city of brotherly shove. Yes, yeah, you're right, it is. No, love, that's it. I messed that up. The city of brotherly love, right in the heart, phileo, Philadelphia, that's where it comes from. That word is right in the the, the middle of this Greek word that is translated covetousness. It means loving your money. It is an affection, a a, a love, living a lifestyle, a a conversation, a way of life. Speaking about someone who who lives the way that they have this affection for, for possessions, for money. You remember the very moral rich man who came to Jesus, and this guy had kept the law from his youth. He came to Jesus. He wanted to know how to to gain eternal life, and Jesus told, told, told him in Mark 10 to sell all that he had and give to the poor and follow Jesus. Now, let me just tell you that. The point of that is not you can go to heaven if you sell all you have and give to the poor, all right? Jesus was honing in on this man's personal wickedness of covetousness, loving his money and making an idol out of it. He, let me say it this way, he loved his money more than he loved following Jesus. And so Jesus deals with the heart of the issue in this man and tells him to repent of it by get rid, okay, get rid of what you have made an idol and follow me. That's what he's saying. The Bible says that the rich man went away sorrowful. He would not do it. It's kind of these things. Then that story that brings this famous line that Jesus says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. What did he mean? People make money their savior and their Lord. You say, I would never make, that's crazy, making money your savior. Oh, what do you look to when you get in trouble? Uh, 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 What? You look... We look so often to, do I have enough money to get out of this problem? You know, and if I have a, enough, a hunk that's big enough, then, then I'm going to feel, you know, satisfied and quiet in my heart because i got a big hunk of money in some whatever, plan, somewhere. And so that's my helper. Whoa, 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 that's not our helper. People make money their Savior and their Lord. It's idolatry. It cannot take Jesus as their Savior, some, some believers, some, no, excuse me, let me back that up, some people who need to be saved cannot, like the rich man, cannot take Jesus as their Savior while they are still worshiping their wealth. They need to repent and turn away from that as their God. The man trusting in his riches does not see himself as poor, for instance, or needy, or destitute. He cannot see that his sin, especially the sin of covetousness, makes him wicked in the sight of God. He needs a Savior who died on the cross for his greediness. Until a man repents of worshiping his money, he cannot be saved. Just like any other sin that a man or a woman wants to hold on to and will not repent and turn away so that he can take the Savior. If you are that moral rich man or woman, see your sin this morning and be reconciled to God by trusting that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your greed. Take the real Savior and the real Lord And turn your back on the God of loving money. This way of life, covetousness, loving money, it's not a small thing in America, is it? You know, it is quite a rich thing that affects everything. Everything from how much you pay uh, as far as uh, insurance to, you know, what things cost to research to everything. The whole, uh, the, the, the very way of life in America in our culture is covetousness and greed and somehow it's been turned around as a positive thing it's the american dream 
to get and have enough and succeed and be prosperous. Every hand we are marketed, we are upsold, we are appealed to, we are tricked and coerced that we must have the best things. We must be rich. We must have more. You deserve more. But here, see one more luxury car commercial that says that I deserve that car. God gives the direct command that our life, our way of life, should not contain love for things and wealth and treasure. In this verse, 1 Timothy 6.10 also says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, what does that mean? That means all kinds or types of evil. It doesn't mean that every sin that you could do comes from loving money. It means it leads, loving money leads to all sorts of types of evil, which while some have coveted after money, they have erred from the faith. There it is. They're believers, but they have gone astray from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Allowing yourself to love money is the starting point, the root for all kinds of evils of your thought and your behavior. And when you start beginning, where can loving money take you? It's kind of shocking. It leads to idolatry, of course, and to dishonesty, and to manipulation, and to hoarding, and to abuse, and to lying, and to neglecting the poor, etc. All kinds of evil comes from you allowing yourself to have affectionate attachment to money. The phileo, love kind of thought about money. This is a huge warning for believers not to err. Notice the second phrase of the verse Timothy 6, verse, many believers have erred or strayed from the faith covenant after money and impaled themselves. They pierced themselves through, impaled themselves with many sorrows because of this pursuit of having more money. One of the ugl- ugliest things, and let me just step out into real life here in a minute. One of the ugliest things that I have ever seen in my entire life, and I've seen it over and over and over, is when a parent or parents pass away and their adult children settle the estate and fight over it. One of the most greedy and ugly and strange and bizarre things that pull out and show how, how possessions and money is idolatry is when even believers are trying to settle estate, brothers and sisters, and they are frictionous and fighting and hateful and maybe break their relationship for many years because they want mom and dad's money. Greed. It really brings out the worst in people. Well, how do I know that I love money? How do you know? Do you, do you think a lot about money? Do you, do you just frankly spend a lot of your time thinking about money or how to manage it or to get more of it? If you have little, do you always dream about getting more? You see, covetousness is not just a sin for the rich man. It's a, it's a sin for the poor as well. Does money often come up in your conversations with other people? Do you let your economic status define you? We will see a verse here in a moment that talks about, you know, tell rich people not to be high-minded. You know, when you get a little bit of money... You're rolling with the big boys. You start looking down on those people. Manage things the way I manage things. You might be able to drive a blank. I can't fill in the blank because they're sitting out in the parking lot. (laughs) Let me ask you this question. If you lost your most prized possession here on earth, would that be maybe your home or vehicle or land or stocks or something, would it devastate you? Would you think life was over if you lost the thing that you value, possession, the most? Do you hoard what you have rather than sharing or meeting the needs of others? Are you territorial about what you have? There was a cartoon not long ago. Mine, 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 all these seagulls, you know, some of you know that cartoon. Mine, mine, mine. Got to have it all. Got to have it all. Do you wish that you had stuff as, as nice as the blank family? Can't use Jones because we got Joneses here. All right? Do you wish that, you, that your stuff was as nice? Do you, you know, some of you, wow, I wish I had. Some of you say that out loud, okay? Do you realize how petty that makes you when you say, well, I wish I had a pull? You say it out loud. Wish I could drive that. 
all right? Covetous thoughts. God gives us a simple command that we can strive to obey through his power. Don't allow loving money to be part of your lifestyle. Verse number five, let your covetous, or excuse me, let your conversation, your lifestyle be without covetousness, without loving money. Take steps to eradicate that. The put off, put on thing. Put off love of money. Do steps, work thinking steps, work real steps in your life to eradicate that from your conversation. Consider God's admonition to people that have more than their needs. You know, this is kind of a a rough thing, the next verse I show you, because honestly, if you were to bring someone from Liberia, somebody from India, or somebody from Romania or whatever, and you would ask them among this crowd who is rich, they would say, everyone. You know, it's just talking, anyone who has anything extra than their basic needs is really rich, is really someone who has whatever. So this admonition comes from the word of God, and don't just don't just think that it's applying to someone else in the congregation. First Timothy 6, 17 says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, snooty, nor trust in uncertain riches. That is feeling confident because they have some money put away. But in trusting what? In the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That money came to you because the Lord gave it to you anyhow. Scripture says, verse 18, that they do good. Charge these people who have extra to do good with that, to, to, that they be rich in good works, okay? There's value, not, you know, not, you know, six digits. What is value is that I am rich, that you're rich in good works, ready to distribute. That, that really means what you think it means. Willing to communicate. That is the idea of sharing. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, what's this talking about? This is a verse about people putting off the love of money, though they may have money, by not being high-minded. I mean, after all, how can you be high-minded about something that's not yours, that you're just managing? Right? Is that right? Amen? Yes? You got it? But rather, putting on, what are they to put on? Trust in the Lord who gave them the nice things to enjoy in the first place, doing good with their possessions by sharing and distributing, Communicating, that's a word, to other people who need it more than they do. The scripture says that that way of life is laying up treasure in heaven that, and, and really laying hold or grasping what eternal life is. It doesn't mean you get saved this way. It means you are living down here what is important up there. You are grasping your eternal life and realizing that money's not important, but helping others is. Doing good works for others is. Trusting in the Lord rather than your bank account is. Some of you really are not in the position financially to do very much to distribute and communicate. And let me just say, the Lord understands that and the Lord knows that. You don't have extra. But some of you do. And you should obey this word of God about sharing and distributing. Government shouldn't tell you to do that. But a believer who has Jesus in his heart wants to do that. That's what the early church looked like, a willingness to help other people. Don't love money. Point number two in the verse, be content. Look what the scripture says, Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be, what's the next word? Yell it out. Yell it out. Be content with such things as ye have. As ye, let, me, let me just clarify it. As ye already have. In some ways, this is a very hard verse for some of you that are scraping to get by when you're, you're told be content with such things as you have and you feel like you just don't have enough. But can I just, I want to just tell you something, okay? Been there, done that. The Lord understands that. And some of you, in his, in his timing, you're just going to have to wait on him to supply your basic needs. Please understand that. Or, or please know that he cares about that. Please understand that, you know, when, when it comes to content, some of you said, I would be content if I could just pay my bills. The Lord knows that, okay? You have to understand that here in this, in this passage. Sometimes you're upside down at the end of the month. I, I want to first say scraping is very hard. It tests your faith. Wait on the Lord. You know, he is the one that you have to trust. You know, he will meet your needs and bills in his time. And his personal testimony, I don't understand sometimes or I haven't understand why the Lord doesn't seem to know that due date on my electric bill the way that Delmarva does. What should we say to these things? 
Well, we're real people in a real world, and sometimes we scrape. But none of us have starved, and uh, our basic needs are met, and the Lord, who is sovereign, knows how to distribute wealth. Be content. Be content. Maybe you look at others that seem to have so much, and you think, I could be content if I had what they have. I could be content if I had just a little bit more. I remember years ago reading a Parade Magazine article that polled people uh, in all financial levels, asking them, how much money would it take for you to have enough? That was the question. And it went from everyone who was, uh, everyone who was unemployed clear up to millionaires. And every case, the answer came back basically the same. How much would I need to, to feel like I had enough? The answer was a little bit more. You know, so, so people on the lower level said, you know, if I had $10,000 more a year, that, you know, that I would have enough. And people who were multimillionaires would say things like, if I had, uh, if I had another $500,000, I would have enough. We've already seen from the parable of the master and the talents that God chooses how much he will entrust to each of us by his sovereign understanding of, of what each of us can handle and what is good for us. And you remember that passage, I think it was two or three weeks ago. It says that he distributed, you know, some, you know, to one guy he gave five talents and two and then one. You know, he distributed to those according to each who, who each had ability, according to their own personal ability, according to what they could handle. You remember that in the scripture? Well, then when, when we consider this command here in this verse to be content with such things as we have, we need to have a little conversation with ourselves. You ever have a little talk with yourself? Sometimes it's very, very good. You need to grab, grab your, look in the mirror and grab yourself by your, you know, your collar. Listen, Toby. There's counseling for people like me. We need to have a little conversation to convince ourselves that the normal way of life, the normal late way of life that God has put me in, I should consider myself as having enough. We have what the Lord wants us to have, and we need to adjust our thinking and our budget to that standard. I'm taking nothing away here from working towards a higher standard, getting more education, whatever, a different job, striving to get ahead or to put more margin or buffer in your finances, whatever. And I'm definitely not saying be content if you can't survive. I mean, you need to go and get a job or get a better job or whatever, I am, or reduce your spending, you know, reduce... Whatever, and by the way, I'm just, you know, I don't want to, this is not meant to be humorous, but three weeks ago, this is the truth. I saved 45% on my car insurance by changing to Geico. <laughs> That's true. 45%. Thank you, Warren Buffett, who owns the company and is striving to be, and by the way, that was real money. That was, that was about 100, 100 bucks a month. That's a real way to reduce and to put margin in the Whitmer's finances. Now everyone run home and tomorrow morning and check out whatever. All right. I'm taking nothing away from this working harder. I'm not saying don't be content if you can't survive. I'm saying as an overall way of life, as a principle of your life, be accepting and content with what God has given you. Don't seek something beyond his will for you. Don't always look that I wish I had this. I wish that my ship would come in. I wish that whatever. I wish that I don't. Forget that. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can take nothing out. That's great humor. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. And that's food and raiment. You know what that means? Food and, and your basic shelter and clothing, raiment. That's basic, you know, having these things, you can be content. You say, I can't, I could never be content with that basic, how embarrassed I would be, whatever. Get out of your American thinking and think about the believers in Romania. The scripture says, but they that will be rich or want to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and in many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. There are so many God thoughts in this verse in 1 Timothy 6, but let me just talk to you about what it says about contentment. Realize that you came in naked and you're going out naked, all right? So if you have your basic needs met, you should be content. 
Godliness is real gain. That is a real asset on the balance sheet. Being godly, the verse says. That's real. You can count that as wealth. The warning at the end is those loving money, wanting to be rich, will fall into traps of covetousness. All kinds of traps. Covetousness will drown men and women in destruction and in judgment, the verse says. Most of you know my father's testimony, and some of you don't because you're new to our church. And it's kind of rough when I talk about these things because my father's presently a missionary. These are pre-missionary days, and that's a whole other story. Most of you know that my father was inches away from a deal that would have made him a multimillionaire. He called the children, we had meetings, and we all were, he, he was a very real deal. He was a businessman and had done very big deals. This was the deal of all deals. But he allowed, in order to close that deal, he allowed a greed and, and uh, avarice and dishonesty into the deal. And it greatly hurt our family, obviously. He spent three years in federal prison for falsifying a prospectus, a stock prospectus of his company. It isn't worth it to love money. I don't want my dad to be a multimillionaire. I want my dad to be godly. I just wanted my dad to be my dad. The love of money will take your mind to all kinds of places. It is a lie. It is a trap. It is a false satisfaction. Contentment is God's way. That is, that is the beautiful way. Contentment is the beautiful way. Not wealth, not huge houses, not incredible cars. Contentment is the beautiful way to be appreciative and thankful for that old couch that your family can still sit on. And it still holds you up. For that worn stool, for that faithful, that was one of my name. For that faithful but aging car. And I've got to be careful what I say. Because this is real stuff. You know, honestly, Americans feel like if they have a car that is older than 10 years old, that that, that is a need. Like food, they have to have a new car. Contentment is God's way, the beautiful way. Being thankful for the stuff you can afford without stretching yourself or without debt. Be content. The average American home has three or more credit cards and according to last year, is the average American home is at least $15,000 in credit card debt. Credit card debt. That's shocking and frankly direct disobedience to this command in scripture. This is not, this $15,000 that most people have is is not emergency debt, that they had to come to the point where they used credit because it was a matter of a need, they were in emergency, there was a great problem, whatever. It's become a way of life for Americans who can't afford things to slap down plastic because you deserve it. You're a champion. Spending more than we can afford, living beyond our needs. And like I said about the Geico comment, and I'm not a representative, by, by the way, for Geico. I did try to get them to send me a shirt, but that didn't happen. Work, instead of having a view, this is a Dave Ramsey thing, instead of having a view of increasing your income, have a view of reducing your expenses. Do whatever you can do, even if it's uncomfortable and maybe even embarrassing, to reduce your expenses. You're spending, well, I just can't do that. I'm going to tell you about this great story. Some of you have heard this. A fellow and I sat in a car. This is when I lived in Pennsylvania, and I was a pastor, and we sat in a car, and uh, he was just telling me that his family was terrible and destitute, whatever, and they couldn't, they couldn't afford anything, and, you know, and I didn't, they didn't know how they're going to get by or whatever. And I knew that this man, this woman, she owned a salon, and he was a, a truck driver, and I knew that they lived in a beautiful home, and, you know, and I, but I was sympathetic, whatever. And so he says, he was sitting out in front of my home, he says, yeah, I just don't know what we do. We just, we just don't have enough money to live. He says, oh, by the way, I, I got to go. I got to take my, my daughter to ballerina lessons. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Some of you may not even connect of why that's even funny. Charles Dickens' famous Mr. Micawber quote in David Copperfield still rings true. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 19 pounds, 19 shillings, and 6 pence. Result, happiness. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 20 pounds, ought, and 6. Result, misery. 
you know what pounds are and all that, it's English and all that, and basically it's saying that if you spend less than you make, then you're, ha you're happy. If you spend more, then you're going to be miserable. I know that that's very hard for some of us. We've been bewitched into a way of life that struggles to say, no, I will not, I cannot buy that. I don't care if everyone else has one, if my child is going to be embarrassed, or if I'm a little bit tattered, you need to say, I will be content. It is a lie. And by the way, that child thing is real. You know, you, your child has to have something because everybody in their class has something. That is not a need. And you'll do, you will do much better in teaching your children to live within means and saying no to expenditures and buying stuff than giving them the latest cell phone, smartphone, tablet, whatever. You are not doing well as a parent giving your child everything that you did not have and you could not afford growing up. In fact, to character, to their character, it will be very good for them to say no to things. To know they can't have the candy bar. They can't go to McDonald's. They can't have the latest thing. They can't have designer clothes. No! Honey, I love you with all my heart. But no, we need to live content in what the Lord has given us. I truly believe that one of the reasons that some people don't think they have enough and they question even God. Well, the, the Lord is not supplying my needs, Pastor Whitmer. It's because they've already spent what should have gone to their bills and their needs on some extravagance. They've already gone to out to eat three or four times before the bills come. And so they don't have the money when they should have the money. Debt hinders a lot of possibility of giving to others and giving to the Lord. Some of you can't, you can't obey God. It's not a good thing. You can't obey God to give tithes and offerings or benevolence to other people who need it because you've gotten yourself into debt that you can't control. Be content and live within your means. And then comes our last point, one of the most beautiful realizations of living. Notice, please, the scripture says, Hebrews 13 you got to know how this flows. I'm going to read it from verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, without the love of money, and be content with such things as ye have for. For, because he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It is a beautiful money promise. It is a beautiful treasure promise. Why should I be content? Why should I not love money? Why, why, why? Because the Lord has made me a promise that if I have him, I don't need all of these extra things. If I have him, did you realize, did you ever realize, you hear it quoted all the time, I just like to give testimony for the Lord and say, he told me I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. Did you know it was a money verse? And so the last point here, point number three in our message, replace love for money with love for God. Replace love for money with love for God. Now that sounds ultra spiritual, okay? I'm going to work this out for us. Here is the motivation for contentment and really the solution to covetousness in the verses. There are at least three understandings here of how the Lord making a promise that he would never leave me and forsake me connect to my wallet, connect to my budget, connect... You know, what, what does that mean? How does that have to do with covetousness? How does that have to do with contentment? Well, first of all, God has to be our valuable thing in life. Our valuable thing. I was telling my Sunday school teacher this morning, we were talking about treasuring Jesus. We were talking about how wonderful Jesus is. And I, and I told him, and I confessed that sometimes, you know, I know these things, and I know that they're wonderful, but my heart doesn't soar like it should. There's something broken in my appreciation and, you know, like if, a, if a, a Porsche 911 Turbo would come down the road, I would go, wow, look at that. Or GTR, that's a, more better. Look at that. Look at that. And I go, cut, like that. But yet I see these incredible truths about the treasure that Jesus is, the incredibleness of Jesus. And I say, yeah, yes. Oh, that our hearts would soar and realize, as David said, thou art my portion, O Lord. What do I want? What am I portion? What amount of inheritance? What do I want? Thou art my portion. You're what I want, O oh Lord. On the surface, this verse is just saying, don't love money, be content with what you have because you have me. And all God's people said to that, 
Amen. Okay, now we got it. That's, that's what we got to strive for in our budget, strive for in our understanding, in our covetous heart. This is, this is rough stuff because I need to grow in the value of God more than I do in, in vehicles or whatever, motorcycles or whatever it is. I, I need to treasure and grow in appreciation to God as much as if I had a million dollars in my 401k. I need to love and appreciate God more than a big house or, or nice clothes. He has to be my treasure. And I don't know how that works, but that's what I need to strive for in sanctification that God and this is what this is saying you know be content don't love after money you got me value me treasure me you say that's impossible there's no connection there well there seems to be to other countries a lot more than here there seems to be these countries Ghana Romania Liberia where there are believers that are rich in God and poor in everything else and they are rich indeed and they are content and they are joyful You know, somebody has got to explain to me the connection to whatever, 15, 20 years ago, that I take a missions trip to Romania with my teenagers, and we do VBSs, and the kids come every day in the exact same clothing with huge smiles on their faces, and they love to see puppets, and they love to to play these corny games, and they're so excited for these opportunities, and the kids of America are so discouraged, depressed, and on medications, but have everything that they could ever ask for. Explain that. Possessions and the pursuit of possessions and money corrupts. That's not where our joy is. Thou art my portion, O Lord. Be content. Don't love money because I will never leave thee nor forsake. You have me. I've, Toby's got to adjust to this. I have got to make that true in my life. I have got to value the Lord and understand that that is a direct connection to my finances. There's the second way this applies, this this promise here, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The second way it applies to my, my wallet, be content, God will provide. So that you, the next verse, can boldly say, the Lord is my helper, not my bank account. So that means that if you are content and you have the Lord, you can be bold about the fact that he will provide for you. That you're not looking for more money to make you secure in your life. That you're really saying, you know, he, he will never leave me for, nor forsake me, so he is my helper. He is the one that's going to help me in this, this present financial need. You don't need to fear something happen to you. The last part of the verse, so that we may, verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. If he's with me, you know, this is financial. This is talking about financial ruin or, or that you, are, you, are, you need money or that you are striving to try to pay things so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. It's a direct comment about finances and creditors and these kind of things. That I have the Lord. And someone said that he's rich. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills. He owns the earth. He owns the fullness thereof. And I look to him as my helper. And I will stay there looking to him. And I will not doubt or scheme or extend myself by credit in a way that would really hurt my family. You are my helper. This is a promise to those who don't love money, who live content. Not a promise to those that live beyond their means and expect God to pay for their extravagance. You know other promises of scripture that back this up. Philippians 4.19 But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God will be your helper. I say that as the mouthpiece of God to you this morning. And frankly, as somebody who has lived by my parents, teaching me those things and Amy and I have seen the Lord provide for us many, many, many times. The third way that this promise of God, I will never leave thee to forsake thee, connects to my wallet is the the last understanding of the promise here is don't love money. Be content because I will never leave thee nor forsake thee is is the realization that God here is contrasting the fact of his unfailing presence in your life with other truths in the word of God that money takes wings and flies away. 
So, so what he's saying here is, you know, all the other passages of scripture that talks about that money is fleeting and you can't count on it and, and like the stock market or the recession just a couple of years ago, some of your houses were worth almost twice of what they're worth now or just a few years ago because of what happened there. You can't, you can't count on those things. You can't count on money. You can't count on stocks. You can't count on great income coming in, but you can count on someone who will not fly away. It's the Lord. And that's the point, the contrast here. You can trust him. You know, money is momentary. It is fickle. Your finances change. Your status change. So he will be with you forever. That's the understanding here. So I'm going to make a point that is so often made to you by Jesus. If those things are true, then invest in him. Invest in what lasts forever. Don't stockpile here. If God will never leave you or forsake you, invest your treasure in him. And this is the uncomfortable application that some believers do not want to make because they say amen to all the rest, but then when it comes down to understanding what is valuable and investing in what's valuable to him and that he loans you the money to manage for his glory and his purposes, then you say, okay, I'm going to check out. It's the word of God that says in Matthew 6, Jesus himself, lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth. That's pretty, pretty clear. Where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, I was just saying, money flies away. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, that's talking about really your wallet, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, or your heart will follow where you financially invest on this earth. Seems like it's a little background, or a little backward, that, like I should get my heart right and then put my treasure. No, the Lord says it's the opposite. You make the decision to invest in things that really matter for eternity and what God wants, and your heart will follow. Since earth is temporary and God is eternal, invest in God things. Where uh, where you put your earthly treasures, where your heart will follow, it is what you will value. Matthew 6.31 then farther along says this, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat and what shall we drink? Wherewith shall we be clothed? Worrying about money. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But, here it is, invest in God things. Don't worry about the money, earthly possession things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you, all these things being your needs. Don't worry about what you have or what you need. God knows that you need, and he is going, your needs, and he's going to provide for what your true needs are. Instead, be consumed and determined to treasure the kingdom of God stuff. That is what God is doing. What, what matters in heaven? God's stuff. What matters to him? The one who gave you the money. The one who owns the money. So why did God, folks, speak 2,000 times in scripture about money? Why did Jesus speak more about finances than any other topic than the kingdom? God knew we would greatly struggle with money and being content. And he knew we would struggle with valuing God and God stuff more than plush leather and beautiful sedans and amazing technology and fabulous fashions and cold, hard cash. Would you bow your heads, please, this morning?